give you a sense of fulfillment. Otherwise, you'd think, what's the, what's the point in carrying on? Perhaps some of you have awakened in the morning and couldn't find a good reason to lift your head off the pillow. Has that happened to anyone here? Yes. You started thinking, what's the point? Why are you going through the effort to struggle for existence? Now, what do we mean by struggle for existence? Because you could say that well, you don't feel like you're struggling all the time. When we think of struggle, we think of things not going your way and you have to battle. But what the Bhakti Yoga texts like Bhagavad Gita will inform you of is that even when you think you're enjoying, you're actually struggling. Now how could that be? It seems like Enjoyment is enjoyment, right? <laughs> when you're happy, you're happy. But you see, take a close look at your so-called happiness. It involves a lot of effort to get to that state in which you feel, oh yes, feeling all right, things are good. It takes a lot of effort to get there. And what about the effort to stay in that happy condition. It's a lot of effort also. Okay, now, things are really going good. I'm really feeling good now. How am I going to keep it? How am I going to maintain this? <laughs> got to preserve the good feeling. So it takes effort to get to that so-called happiness. It takes effort to maintain the so-called happiness and a lot of worry. Perhaps you can remember. You're saying to yourself, oh, this is too good to be true. I can't believe it. <laughs> and you shouldn't believe it. <laughs> but you can't help falling victim to what Bhagavad Gita refers to as temporary happiness and distress. We don't know anything beyond that. You don't want the suffering. You don't want the misery. But you certainly want the happiness. But what Krishna tries to teach us in Bhagavad Gita is that the happiness we want, it's not real. It's just like the shadow of happiness. Real happiness doesn't involve so much struggle to get it and maintain it, and so much fear and anxiety that the so-called happiness will disappear, which it will. So just see yourself, put yourself under, the microscope and look at yourself. <laughs> you might ask, well, how can you do that? How can you put yourself under a microscope and look at yourself at the same time? But this is the advantage of Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita. You can actually do a double take on yourself. You can put yourself under the lens and you can look at yourself and then start to wonder what am I all about anyway? What is it that I'm trying to do? And you'll see that practically almost all of your endeavors are pertaining to trying to grab happiness and beat back distress. That's the way the days and the nights go, right? Grab happiness, because you're sure it's out there. It's 
out there. It's yours for the taking, for the grabbing. And then, while you're trying to grab happiness, you have to fight off distress. And if the better you think you do that, or more accurately, the better the world thinks you're doing that, then you are known as successful, right? That's why you know so many persons who are known to be the life of the party, they're known to be so successful, but inside they're aching. You've seen that? <laughs> but image counts so much. It counts for so much in this world. So even if you can give others the impression that you're happy and fulfilled, that's good enough, right? Impressions are very important. Who wants to be known as a loser? So even though you're aching inside and empty inside, if people think you're successful, that gives you a kind of lift, doesn't it? You'll buy into their illusions of how they look at you, right? If, yeah, yeah. Uh, successful, of course, me. <laughs> you got it, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm doing good. <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> Isn't it so? Has anyone ever told you, for example, that you're beautiful? We'll ask the ladies. Has anyone ever told you you're beautiful? How, raise your hand, please. Ladies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can, raise your hands again, please. Yeah. Oh, and what was your reaction? Oh, no. No, no. Oh, you said, oh, no, no, but inside, <laughs> what were you thinking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad someone noticed the reality. <laughs> And you began to think even more nicely of the person who said that, right? <laughs> and what about the men? Someone told you, you actually, you're quite good looking and handsome. How many has that happened to Raise your hand. So how did you feel? Yeah. You felt empowered, right? Yeah, me. Yeah. Good looking, handsome. <laughs> you probably, as soon as you could, found a mirror and checked yourself out again, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right? Next time you looked in the mirror, you were sure to <laughs> examine yourself carefully and kind of bask in your glories. So, I'm pointing this out so that we can see how easily we buy into the dreams of others. You gotta watch this, you see, because what happens is that people have their own dream world and therefore they flatter you because in a sense what they're saying is you allow me to be in a dream world and I'll allow you to be in a dream world. So unconsciously, you're making a, a treaty. <laughs> Inside, people are suffering. They're empty. But outside, you trade dreams. And that's considered good business. I'll accept your dream about yourself if you accept my dream about myself. And this way we'll get along. It's a very widespread and popular sport known as dream weaving. <laughs> so, next time you're trying to build a relationship with someone, or exploring a relationship with someone, the possibilities, you can just say to them, 
let's weave some dreams together. <laughs> because that's what it's all about. What Krishna wants to do in Bhagavad Gita <clears throat> is to take us beyond temporary happiness and distress. We don't like distress. I don't think anyone here likes to suffer, be miserable. But the happiness that we're working so hard to get is so insubstantial. And we shouldn't be afraid to see that. I know it can sound intimidating. The happiness I'm getting is insubstantial. No, no, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to consider it. <laughs> After all, everyone is pursuing temporary happiness, right? It can't be so bad. What do you think? It can't be so bad, right? If everyone is doing that. I mean, how, look, how many persons are in this world are seriously chanting Hare Krishna? And how many persons are seriously pursuing material happiness? Every, uh, billions of people can't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it. Why should you try to be beyond your body and mind? What are the advantages? You ever wondered about that? Because this temporary body, this temporary mind, seem to offer sometimes some attractive physiological and psychological stimulations. And if you can just get a few seconds of those physiological and psychological stimulations, it seems life is worthwhile, right? Yes? You're, I'm sure you've told yourself that. That was, that was a good night two weekends ago. <laughs> Everything just clicked. What a night. If you just get a few hours why hours? Just a few moments of favorable stimulations. You delude yourself into thinking, now my life is worthwhile. Some of you may remember. I was... I spoke about... Maybe I did it here, maybe I didn't speak about it here in Los Angeles, but still it's worth hearing again if you've heard it before. I was doing a program in the UK, in Manchester, at the University of Manchester. And so there were university students gathered for this program, studying engineering, or some are going to become doctors, lawyers. And so I asked them what seemed to be, I guess, a dumb question. I asked them, what do you do on a Friday night? And they kind of looked at me like I was from another planet. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, what do we do on a Friday night? What kind of question is that? Everyone knows what to do on a Friday night and what everyone else is doing on a Friday night. And I said, well, uh, you know, I could be mistaken, so can you kindly tell me what you all do on a Friday night? I said, sure. Uh, we get completely wasted. <laughs> so then I asked, what, what happens Saturday afternoon when you come to, when you wake up? <laughs> Saturday afternoon. Oh, you feel so groggy, splitting headache. And so I asked, what kind of happiness is this? One night you're wasted, the next day you wake up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you're totally miserable because what goes up has to crash down. But they said, no, no, you don't understand. It was all worth it just to get those few hours on Friday night. 
Yes, maybe some of you have thought like that. It was all worth it just for a few hours on Friday night. Okay, we have to suffer on Saturday. When we wake up in the afternoon. But <laughs> just think of those couple of hours of being jolly drunk or jolly high on Friday night and just having a good time with the friends. That's what it's all about. It doesn't get any better than that. Truly superlative goals. You can do it. It's not about what your income is or what your level of education is. You can be the richest person in the world and still from the viewpoint of the bhakti yogis, you're poverty stricken. Because you don't know anything about who you are and what is real happiness. Regardless of your income, regardless of your education, you have a chance to apply this topmost process of lifestyle engineering. So the question is, when do you want to really get your life going? One thing I think so many of you are afraid of is you don't want to be indoctrinated by some kind of religious belief. But you do want the experience of what is life like beyond temporary happiness and distress. What could that life be like? What's it like when I'm out of the forest of illusion? And sometimes you even dare to think, perhaps I could be a transcendentalist, right? I think most of you here, you're entertaining that thought. Maybe I could do this. Of course, in the back of your mind are all kinds of voices trying to discourage you. Who do you think you are? Get real, we know where you're at. <laughs> you're no saint, who are you trying to fool? <laughs> So you have to learn how to handle that propaganda voice in the back of your mind. That's why the chanting of Hare Krishna is so important. It purifies your consciousness from all that static and all that discouragement, which is brought about by contact with the material energy. The whole point is to have a lifestyle that brings about purification of material contamination. By chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, you wake up from the dream of material existence. You're no longer uh, victimized by so much propaganda. I want a relationship like the movies, what I see in the movies. You're no longer ensnared by other people's dreams of material existence that they impose upon you. You look it's successful. Things seem to be going good for you. And what's your immediate response? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Life is good. <laughs> Anyone remember? You remember saying that to someone? Yeah, life is good. What would happen when you said that? What, 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 what? Well, I'm pretty sure I was fooling myself. Yeah. But nevertheless, what was going on? Uh, let's see. Um, maybe like you just graduated school. So that so makes you feel good. You're on the, the right track to mm -hmm. a career. Mm -hmm. So you would say that to your friends? Yeah, life is good. <laughs> I just graduated from what, high school? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So somehow that you felt that that was going to lead to something big, huh? <laughs> Graduating from high school was going to lead to something big. <laughs> I guess we all want that kind of sense of completion, you know? I finished high school, or I finished this, or I finished that. I remember when I graduated from university, I didn't want to go to the graduation ceremony. I just thought it was uncool. <laughs> I happened to mention to my parents, and of course you know what they said. 
<laughs> they just couldn't believe it. I said, well, yeah, what's the point? You, know, you put on, you know, these gowns and a cap, you know. You have to march. I, said, well, uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I just wanted to get out of there, you know. <laughs> but people like this sense of completion. And I can understand that psychology. It comes from completing real goals. And that's what the lifestyle engineering knowledge that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita is about. Completing real goals. Because material existence is the shadow of spiritual existence, there's a glimmer of reality in material existence. So therefore people like these milestones of completion, graduations, the various markers of the phases in your life. They like they like that. Anyone else? Remember saying, oh, life is good. Hmm? Well, yeah, I just ran into somebody at the store today. They asked, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. That's I'm the good. standard California answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> they told you that. No, that's. I mean, that's my response. Even if I'm not, even if I'm not feeling good, I mean. Right. You feel it's your social duty to hold up the illusion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did your part, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Carry the torch. Pass the pass the torch. Yeah. yeah I'm good. I'm good. Oh, am I gonna, you know, stop in the line and lay on her everything? Or <laughs> Anyone else? First job. Huh? Your first, the first job. When you got your first job, you felt like, wow, now you're in the money, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you got power, right? You got but your own finances, huh? So you really felt life is good. Yeah, uh, you know, you're on the right track, doing what everyone else is doing. And they all must be right. Yeah. <laughs> anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Uh. Finally, out of a bad relationship, <laughs> like life's good <laughs> again. Yeah, okay, okay. Gonna wash that man out of your hair, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you didn't think like that at the start of the relationship, right? No. What did you think? Tell us. This might be different. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the men love to hear that. <laughs> they love to have a lady tell them, you know, I think you're different. Because <laughs> I know it's not true. <laughs> yeah. wouldn't, you, wouldn't you love it to hear a lady tell you, you know, I think you're different. Oh, you, you would certainly agree. Oh, you, oh, you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you got the same agenda as every other man. <laughs> but you have successfully convinced her that you're different, or she has deluded herself into thinking you're different. Special. Yeah. Special. Yeah. Through, through, she's deluded herself through a process of self medication. <laughs> So you wanted to think that, right? No, I mean, you, I think you go into it with your intention feeling that uh, it's different or that this person is special or I think sometimes you think highly of your choices. And, then and your you think, intuition, right? Yeah, so you think, oh, if I think he's special, then he must be special. <laughs> <laughs> and then it starts to... Uh, then what happens? <laughs> all the... Little things start to kind of fall like that image that you have of that person. Yeah. Start to one by one, you're like, oh, well, look at that, not as perfect as I thought he was. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you come to the actual reality of a material relationship. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Mm. <laughs> but you want to believe, right? Um, I think at the point right now, it's not so much. I think it's more like it's very boring because it's 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 very similar to every other relationship. Of course. And, and it's almost like really, it's like it's, you almost expect it after a while. You should. Yeah. <laughs> it's just physiology and psychology. And attachments. You get attached. You get attached to physiology and psychology. And a lot of that attachment is all about hopes, wishing and hoping. You project your hopes on the other person. <laughs> now, we've explained so many times that in the bhakti culture, there are relationships, but the purpose of the relationships, no matter what type they are, is mutual help in enlightenment how to become real, rather than help each other to be an illusion. Bhakti is a very social process, very communal process. And the relationships of whatever type, they're all focused on achieving the ultimate goal in life, and therefore the relationships are for real. But if someone is just dealing with your temporary coverings of mind and body, which you are not, how can the relationship be for real? I often, I often ask this question. How many of you have kind of looked at someone and with all the sincerity you could muster up at the time, said, I'm for real. Anyone done that? <laughs> it's like a really dramatic moment, right? <laughs> Better than the movies, right? <laughs> I'm for real. Anyone? Only one person? Yeah. Great line, isn't it? <laughs> what were you thinking when you said that? That, it, that I'm not going to make a mistake, that I'm gonna, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen, I'm going to reach my goal. Sometimes I, I say that when I try to reach a goal, whether it's material or spiritual. Or Who do you say it to? Myself. Oh, that you're for real. Yeah. All right. But I, have you ever said it to someone else? <laughs> uh, yeah, but mostly they know I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> but why did you say it then? Just to, uh, I mean, it depends on the situation, more likely to get something. Oh, I see. And you remember saying it? Yeah, maybe I said it to a girl. Mm -hmm. Why? Maybe. I'm trying, to of, I'm trying to think of what I was trying to convince her of. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Ladies never say that, huh? It's a guy's thing to say that, is that it? I think I'd say more like, I'm serious. <laughs> oh. You are special. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> I mean, not anymore. <laughs> so, if we want to be for real, if we want to be special, then we need to be able to rise above temporary happiness and distress. And that requires lifestyle engineering. Otherwise, you're just the same. It's the same old mess, the same old song. This is why Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita are so important. How to sort yourself out. How to get a life. You can't have a life submerged in temporary happiness and distress. And to rise above that temporary happiness and distress, you need a taste of the superior reality. Otherwise you're never going to leave the inferior. So if you can grasp these points, you can actually turn your life around and be of the greatest value to yourself and to countless others. All right, a few questions and we'll go to Kirtan. Yeah, you just mentioned that taste of something different. What are 
what are some ways that, that people can, can get that? Bhakti yoga is known as the linking process. How to connect with the ultimate reality, how to connect to Krishna. Requires lifestyle adjustments, lifestyle engineering. A prime method that you add to your life is the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. That sound vibration accomplishes both negative and positive purposes. It removes the unwanted things from your life and it brings to you the spiritual necessities all through sound vibration. The more you take shelter, like a child takes shelter of a good mother, the more you take shelter of the Hare Krishna mantra, the more connected you are. And you'll see your life transform right before your eyes. Any other questions? Yes. Prior to uh, racing over here, actually, um, I was oh, nice to see you again. <laughs> I was uh, listening to uh, one of your lectures uh, on YouTube uh, on matters of the heart, and it kind of coincides a little with what you're talking about um, in relationships. Um, uh, you talk about the relationship that devotees sometimes have um, in Krishna consciousness in the beginning. You're, it's kind of like a relationship. You're so excited about it. Everything's so new, and you kind of uh, you get so wrapped up in the newness of it, and then it kind of, I mean, from my own personal experience, it's, that newness kind of wears off, and you kind of uh, lose a little bit of that excitement. And uh, I actually wanted to ask, uh, what can someone do to maintain that consistent uh, consistency in the practice? Because I, for me, it did. It, it, uh, you become like whom you associate with. If you associate with those who are in illusion, uh, even despite your best intentions, they're going to affect you. It's like trying to light a fire with wet wood. It'll just be some sputtering at best. So you have to really understand that you're shaped by your association. become like whom you associate with. Can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> so if you're serious about a goal, even a material goal, if you're serious about a material goal, you want to associate with those who can help you achieve that goal. Just like if you want to go to college, you don't hang out with a bunch of high school dropouts. <laughs> To sort of be like that you're saying um, the not getting anxious about unhappiness and versus happiness and kind of being you know calm going between both of those and sort of similar I wasn't saying going between both of those and I wasn't saying be calm Arjuna was not calm in Bhagavad Gita he had a job to do meaning he had uh, an action to do. Uh, he was a warrior who was fighting for the highest purposes. So obviously a warrior is not going to be calm, he's going to be very uh, energetic. So I wasn't speaking about finding a spot between happiness and distress. I was saying go above it that's Krishna's message in Bhagavad Gita, to rise above the happiness and distress by engaging your senses in the spiritual process of bhakti. Connecting your senses to the ultimate goal of life. Material life involves your senses and spiritual life also involves your senses. Therefore, we talked about lifestyle engineering. How 
to, instead of using your senses to bury yourself in illusion, you can use your senses for achieving enlightenment. And that enlightenment means the love supreme. The supreme relationship. Beyond all the temporary material relationships. This is what Krishna is leading to in Bhagavad Gita. So it's not just about being calm and find an equilibrium between happiness and distress. You can't. You've got to get off the material platform. Go above the material platform. That's the point. Anything else? Exactly. That's considered high philosophy these days. My body wants it. <laughs> this is why Krishna in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita explains. So you get it straight. The body is just like a garment. Saying my body wants it is like saying my my green shirt wants it. <laughs> You're not the shirt, and you're not the body. So the first step in yoga is how to rise above the urges of the body and the mind and the senses. Otherwise, our life is no better than animal, animal life. Look at the cats, look at the dogs, look at the monkeys. <laughs> They're not worried about sense control. <laughs> this human form of life gives you the chance to become the master of your senses, master of your mind. Okay? All right, let's do a little bit of chanting. <laughs> be a doctor. She said, and you know what the funniest thing is? The most amazing thing, the most incredible thing, <laughs> is when you wake up Saturday afternoon, 3 o'clock, and someone is next to you, and you can't remember how we got there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and everyone just laughed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then she said, and, and then Monday morning, when you go back to class, you tell all your friends and everyone just laughs. <laughs> so she said, this is what it's all about. Just having a good time. You may not even remember how things happen, but things happen. Aren't you attracted to that kind of life? Just let the good times roll. Just, you know. You want to have fun? You have these bodies and minds? Hasn't someone told you before that God gave you these bodies to enjoy? How many have heard that one before? Yeah. <laughs> How many believed it? <laughs> sure, yeah. It sounds good. Like good philosophy, doesn't it? <laughs> we don't know anything about God. But if someone says, God gave us the bodies to enjoy, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> High philosophy. <laughs> In other words, if there is a God, then, okay, he's given the bodies to enjoy. All right, cool. That's all I need to know. But if you read Bhagavad Gita, you find out that this body is a machine meant for suffering. But it's hard for us to accept, isn't it? Until you're trained to think more deeply. Until you're trained to have a penetrating vision. Then you can see what's going on. 
And that's what Bhagavad Gita is trying to do for you. To give you the eyes to see the illusion operating all around you and within you. In other words, what we think is happiness is actually such a substandard experience. But we're so desperately attached to those shadows of temporary happiness. It's amazing how t attached we are, isn't it? We don't know anything else. That's why transcendental knowledge is so important. That transcendental knowledge, meaning knowledge beyond things that have a beginning and end. Knowledge beyond matter. If the knowledge is beyond matter, that means it's beyond temporary happiness and distress. So many times in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna urges genuine yogis to learn how to handle the comings and goings of happiness and distress. Krishna says that these sensations of happiness and distress come and go like the winter and summer seasons. So the genuine yogi is not disturbed. Now just think, everyone knows what it's like to be disturbed by distress, bad news. But how could you be disturbed by happiness? What do you think? The anxiety that you're going to lose it. Yes, but even more so. That's a good point. Even while you're so-called happy, in the back of your mind is a thought. This is going to fade. I'm going to lose it. It's too good to be true. It can't last. I told you, some of you remember, one of my favorite songs when I was a little boy. Eight years old. Will you still love me tomorrow? <laughs> Tonight you're mine completely. You give your love so sweetly. <laughs> the light of love shines brightly in your eyes. But, will you still love me tomorrow? <laughs> That's anxiety. Okay, things are going good tonight, but what's going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> so yes, the so-called temporary happiness has that anxiety mixed in with it. But there are other aspects of this happiness we accept as so real. Besides the anxiety, it's actually an agitation to your mind. It's like a fever. Material happiness is like a fever. It hits you and then it fades away. And when that material happiness hits you like a fever, it takes your mind off of what is the real goal of life. You get into a tizzy. You, can you remember how you felt when you were <clears throat> hit with some happiness? You just become dizzy about it. And, and you really feel, now my life is worthwhile. Even though we lack the knowledge of who we are, we lack the knowledge of why we're in this world. But we don't care because our mind is tiliated by these temporary feelings of happiness. So the yogi, the genuine yogi can see that just as distress agitates your mind, so does happiness. Both distract you. And the intelligent person doesn't want to be distracted. 
The intelligent person wants to focus on what is the real purpose of life. But how are you going to do that in today's society? Everything about today's society means no focus except on your temporary body. Everyone is trained in maximum body consciousness. Focus on your body, worship your mind, your feelings, and in relationships you look for persons who can focus on your body and your mind. <laughs> who is the ideal partner? Someone who knows what you want to feel before you feel it. <laughs> Physically and mentally. Someone who can just uh, respond immediately to what your body wants, what your mind wants. Wouldn't that be great, huh? <laughs> That's the dream. And of course, Hollywood and Bollywood convince you that that dream is real. I was speaking where? Maybe it was in Gainesville, Florida. I was telling a true story to show you how people have bought into the illusion so deeply. And the habit is so ingrained. So there are these two twin sisters. One is a full bhakti yoga practitioner and the other is a normal suburban married lady, 28, 29. So the one who's the normal suburban lady, the stock nice husband, the stock nice house, the stock one child, two cars in the garage, everyone in the town that she lived in thought, Oh, she's got it good. She's got a good man who makes good money. She's got a good house. She has a, a child. Everything is just so nice for her and her family. But as the way things go in this world, you get your good karma and you get your bad karma. They don't know when either is coming. So her husband's best friend, who was the best man at the wedding, suddenly he commits suicide. And the husband is uh, just totally knocked on his feet. He can't believe it. And so he starts turning to drinking. And every day he's drinking and the wife is seeing this and getting upset and obviously the relationship changes when someone is just drinking heavily day after day after day. I mean you could in one sense understand the guy's devastated, he lost his best friend, suddenly committed suicide. So this is a true story. <clears throat> in this perfect relationship, perfect suburban relationship. Things are happening. They had a party at their house. You know, a party for, you know, persons between the age of 25 and 35. You invite per people over, you know, you play some music, you serve some food, and, and of course, lots of alcohol. So of course, what do you think happened to the husband? I mean, he's already drinking every night, and what do you think he's going to do at a party? <laughs> he's going to drink more. So, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, the husband is just crashed out in a drunken stupor on the couch. And a few people, you know, there's people there still partying and dancing. And so, some or other, the wife finds herself in a back room in her house with another man. 
you know, it's a party and psh, why not? Husband's drunk on the couch. <laughs> He's having his fun. <laughs> Yeah. Why not? <laughs> if the goal of life is to please your senses, why not? Is there some God who's going to strike you with a lightning bolt? <laughs> you know, you just got to do the best you can at the moment, you know. She's under a lot of stress. Husband's drinking every night. Have a party to relieve the stress, right? Probably some of you here, you've had parties or gone to parties just to get stress off your mind, work stress or relationship stress. Or... Yeah, so she's just going for what she knows. <laughs> Probably wasn't getting enough attention from her husband because he'd been drinking every night for a while. And, yeah. So no doubt she fantasized in her mind that this is going to be like in the movies. <laughs> Just a fling. So anyway, she does tell her husband two weeks later, you know, by the way, while you were crashed out on the couch in a drunken stupor, uh, things do happen, you know. And the husband took it in stride, like, yeah, man. Because, you know, there's no higher understanding of life. Meanwhile, she goes on seeing the guy, the other guy, and they start, you know, discussing the possibilities of... So she's right on the edge of breaking her marriage. And the whole town is kind of talking about it. It's one of those kind of towns. <laughs> Weren't they the ideal suburban couple? <laughs> So her sister, who is a bhakti practitioner, her twin sister, is trying to talk her out of it, trying to settle her down, trying to get her to patch everything up. And then she just honestly, you know, confides in her sister, her twin sister. But look, I want a relationship like in the movies. <laughs> so what do you think of that? Isn't that a legitimate aspiration? A relationship like in the movies. And she felt she's not getting that. She's getting bored. Bored housewife. Everything's too nice. She wants to be happy. So naturally, if you have no higher knowledge, you turn to the conventional methods of so-called happiness, which agitate your mind. They don't provide clarity. They don't provide enlightenment or illumination. Simply you become dull. Think about it. How can happiness, or what people know to be happiness, how can that make you dull? You become conditioned. Bhagavad Gita explains. Like you condition dough before you're breaking, baking bread. Similarly, you become conditioned by the so-called happiness. Your expectations lower. And you are ready to accept the same kind of sensory experiences that the animals accept. Think about that. You're prepared to accept the same kind of sensory stimulations that the animals can get without working a job. <laughs> How many of you ever thought about that before? Raise your hand. Yeah? <laughs> Why not? I will be now. <laughs> Do you think that human sensual experiences have a different flavor than animal sensual experiences. But just think of all the trouble that animals, me, that humans have to go through to get that same thing that the animals are getting without so many plans and arrangements. Hmm. 
So when we don't have any higher knowledge, when we have no knowledge beyond temporary happiness and distress, our life becomes very miserly. A miser, as you know, is someone who has a great fortune but refuses to spend it. This is why in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna points out to Arjuna, uh, don't be miserly. You have this human form of life which has, in, which has incalculable value. But if you neglect the real value of the human form of life, you're being a miser. You're not spending the great gift that you have. So that is the tragedy that the bhakti yogi sees looking at the world. It, it's very sorrowful to see persons with that rare human body struggling and working so hard to get the same flavors that the cats and dogs and birds and bees get. Isn't that embarrassing? The same flavor. Packaging is different sometimes, but the flavor is the same. So just think, why am I struggling so hard just to get that same flavor that the animals are getting without having to work a job, without having to study in school? without having to follow any social formulas and ex meet social expectations. So now ask yourself the question, what is it about your life that is better than what your four-legged friends are doing? Ask yourself that question. Who can say? Yes. We get to dance. Get to dance? <laughs> what, at a nightclub or something? Or? <laughs> you know, boxy dance. Oh, that, uh, uh, that's not ordinary dancing. But, but in terms of ordinary dancing, you ever see peacocks dance? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are other creatures that dance bhakti dancing of course that's something else that's actually not about the material world anyone else what, what, what could you be doing or what could you say that someone is doing that is actually more substantial and higher than what the animals are doing. Worshipping God. Worshipping God. Yes. Hmm. But of course, if we're if our so called worship of God is potent, we have to have knowledge of God. Otherwise that so called God worship is just an empty shell. Granted an empty shell is better than nothing. Who defines that knowledge? the knowledge of God, who finds it? Hmm. Obviously, as you'll find in Bhagavad Gita, the most reliable source of information about the Supreme is the Supreme Himself. So in Bhagavad Gita, you have the advantage of being at the top of the yoga ladder and you can hear directly from Krishna about Krishna. That's the advantage of Bhagavad Gita. Otherwise, we're so tiny. How can we, as tiny particles of the Supreme, understand the unlimited? It doesn't work coming from us. But it works the other way. Because Krishna is infinite, that means Krishna has infinite possibilities. And one of those infinite possibilities is that he can make himself known to the finite. Because the infinite is infinite. Krishna can f reveal himself to someone who's so tiny. But it doesn't work the other way. The tiny cannot grasp on its own the infinite. So this is the bhakti advantage. 
Any other? Uh, well, yes. We can uh, question things. Question things. Like, yes. Human beings can question things. But in a sense, the animals also question. They have ways of communicating. Where is food? The birds chirping when they... The ants can communicate when they find some sugar. So the real thing is that human beings can question about what is the ultimate goal of life. That's what really makes the difference in the questioning. Anyone else? We can read. Read about what? Nice <laughs> stories that entertain us. <laughs> and what are nice stories that entertain you? What are they about? Well, the dogs can, they, the dogs have action. <laughs> the dogs have <laughs> easy romance, you know. They don't have to, you know, spend money to take someone out, you know. <laughs> we want to develop the motivation to go higher in our life. We don't want to waste our life's energies on what is so easily available for the lower species of life. We want to go higher. Now please try to look at your life and see how possibly you're being overwhelmed by physical and mental stimulations. So much so that you're trapped. You can't get out of this kind of existence. You ever have that feeling? It's just going on all around me. It's even going on within me, in my mind, in my body. It's just all about mental and physical stimulations. You feel trapped and frustrated because you cannot be satisfied in that way. This is the basic problem of material existence. <laughs> that we can't be truly satisfied with materialism because we're not material. But we try so hard, right? Can you remember how hard you try to make it work? Perhaps you can remember even saying to someone, let's make it work. <laughs> right? Let's make it work. People have such a difficult time having relationships these days that it's an accepted thing to say that we need to work on this relationship. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> nothing comes naturally, nothing comes easy. Even to relate to someone else, you've got to work at it. So you've got to work for money. You've got to work for social prestige and respect. And you've got to work for relationships. This is not an intelligent way to live. So what Krishna is presenting in Bhagavad Gita is the perfection of the lifestyle. Krishna wants you to get a life. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying in Bhagavad Gita. Get a life, please. <laughs> and what do you say? Oh, I'm not, it's not so bad. Yeah, I'm happy sometimes. I remember that last summer, you know. When <laughs> We're so miserly. We're bought off so cheaply. Like when the first Dutch settlers purchased the island of Manhattan from the Indians for a few trinkets. That's what our life was like. The first step in self-realization, the first step in enlightenment, is to realize how overpowered you are, how outgunned you are by material nature, enslaved by temporary happiness and distress. 
just bouncing from one to the other. Now I'm happy. Now I'm distressed. Now I'm in between. That's all that's going on. <coughs> so Krishna wants to take you to a higher level. Above this temporary happiness and distress. But we're so attached. We don't know anything else. So we're afraid to let go of that temporary happiness. Because then you might just have nothing. Right? That's our fear. Alright, I know material happiness is substandard and it's got, a, it's got some problems. But it's all I know about. This is why... We need the bhakti process to gradually ease us into non-material happiness. And that will come about through lifestyle engineering. This is what Krishna is teaching. This is the science that Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita. Lifestyle engineering. Now, I, I think most of you would agree you could use some of that, right? <laughs> How to maximize your lifestyle 